Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 20th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, Michael and I discuss the op-ed we jointly wrote on fiscal policy and some of the reactions to it. Second, we discuss some of the common myths used to justify and rationalize continued PFD cuts. And third, we start identifying some of the issues we think will be prominent in this coming campaign cycle and how we are starting to think about them. And now, let's join Michael. I want to talk about the weekly top three, so we're going to start off. Um, no self-promotion here, but hey, we, we did a thing. Brad and I did a thing. Um, well, let's 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 face it. Brad did more work on it than I did, but I did work on it. It's it's fine. Uh, an op-ed piece that uh, has now been featured in papers across Alaska, talking about the legislature's failure um, in protecting the overall Alaska economy. In fact, failing the middle and lower income families more in protecting the top twenty percent. This opinion piece has garnered some interesting discussion uh, wherever it has come up. Um, and some people seem shocked. Shocked, I tell you, that we would point this out, uh, Brad. <laughs> yeah, it. Um, I, I will say this: the the comments in the ADN uh, were more mild than I've seen them in the past. Now they're moderating the comments, so that's probably that's probably uh, some of it. Uh, but there were good points, uh, you know, points that 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 they were raised that that need to be discussed um, uh, in the comments, and uh, and I think it's worthwhile to to talk about them. All right. Well, let's dive into it. What caught your attention uh, the most? Because there are some, there are some interesting ones in here, and some that are just flat out wrong. But uh, you know, w- what's your take? Well, the first one, the first one that caught my attention was uh, uh, one comment said, "Don't tax me for your PFD." And if there's anything we did uh, in the uh, in the column, it was it tr- it was point out. That the that the PFD doesn't come from either oil taxes or or wouldn't come from uh, personal income taxes it, or personal taxes of any sort, it comes from the permanent fund earnings. Uh, that's what that's the statutory uh, uh, genesis of the PFD, and it would continue to be the statutory and it will continue to be the statutory genesis of the PFD. Taxes would be to pay for the portion of government uh, not covered by the other fifty percent. Uh, of the permanent fund earning stream that's going to pay for government, right? Um, and, and 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 either oil taxes or uh, uh, an increase in oil taxes or some personal taxes uh, would be used for that. None of that would be used for the PFD. This is a uh, it's sort of a Natasha deal where she's tried to obfuscate uh, what's going on with the PFD and try to confuse uh, the issue by saying, well, taxes would be to pay for your, your PFD. They're right. not. Taxes are to pay for government. The PFD is paid separately <laughs> well, this is, uh, from the permanent fund earnings. This is the this is not just Natasha, although she is one of the prime candidates of it. This is the this is the mantra of the powers that be and the business as usual club on why we can't have a PFD because you'd have to have taxes to pay for it. I mean, this is the perfect example of somebody who has bought that hook, line, and sinker and is just parroting it back to you. Oh yeah, it's, it's the top. It's the top. It's one of the top twenty percent defense mechanisms. That you would you would tax me in order to pay a PFD to somebody else. Well, if if we don't tax you, if we cut the PFD instead, uh, what we're really doing is taxing middle and lower income Alaska families. We're taking money. 
that are that's statutorily set aside for them um, from a from a source of wealth that nobody uh, has invested in free monies essentially. We're taking their share, middle and lower income Alaska family share, uh, to cover uh, taxes that you ought, otherwise ought to be paying to uh, to pay for government. So it's it's a top twenty five, top twenty percent defense approach, um, and you know, and one that one that I see up see come up often, but it's a myth. Taxes not taxes would not be used to pay for the PFD. Taxes would be used to pay for the of government, uh, the cost of government above. The uh, the other fifty percent aside for uh, government. So, and, and again, this is the argument that we've continued to make that you know you have to keep everything in its lane. The PFD comes from the earnings. Anything else you want beyond that, beyond their fifty percent of those earnings, is on you. And that's where the taxation question comes in. And uh, and I and I think this whole thing is just super super fascinating. Um, as as it go through it now, somebody in the chat room talks about one of the other arguments that we saw in there, which is well, the lower twenty or you know ten or twenty or thirty percent income earners, they're using more state services, so they should pay for it more. Um, and I mean, I got a couple comments on that, but let's get your take on it first. Well, we address that also in the. I mean, it's not an argument we haven't seen before. We address that uh, in the op ed. Uh, PFD cuts take nine times more from lower income Alaska families. Five times more from the next uh, uh, 20% uh, lower middle income Alaska families, four times more uh, from middle income Alaska families, and even two times more from upper middle uh, income Alaska families. There's no, there's no economic analysis that's ever been done that shows that those classes are using more government services than the top 20%, but certainly no economic analysis that's ever been shown that they're using those multiple uh, times uh, uh, the top 20%. It's again, it's another uh, uh, top 20% def defense mechanism of, oh, well, you know, we're just, we're just charging those who cost government more, uh, more, but we're, we're, we're charging them multiples more than any economic analysis has ever shown uh, that they, uh, that they might be uh, uh, costing in terms of, additional money uh, uh, from from government. Well, and there's a secondary aspect of that as well. Uh, if we are costing them, you know, a lot more, the other ones who are actually benefiting from this is not just lower income earners who are utilizing the services, the service providers who happen to be in the top 20% of the income don't want that gravy train to end either. So we've created a dependency loop in both directions, um, which is fascinating from an economic standpoint, for sure. Yeah. It, I that's that's an excellent point. I mean, when when, when Governor Dunleavy proposed Medicaid cuts, uh, cuts to state support of Medicaid, which would have reduced uh, Medicaid payments, the biggest reaction was not from advocates for the lower twenty percent. It was from the doctors, uh, the doctors who who get the money uh, from the Medicaid services. I mean, the lower twenty percent get the benefit of medical services, but they don't get the dollars. The dollars go to the docs in the hospital community. And I recall one meeting uh, that Governor Dunleavy had uh, during uh, 2019 when he had, when he had proposed uh, these cuts and he was out on the road trying to uh, explain them. And, and, and it was, it was a meeting with the docs and the docs were just outraged that, uh, that the governor would, would propose cuts in Medicaid. So you're exactly right. It's not only, not only are the, uh, not only are the uh, uh, the amount of services being received by middle and lower income Alaska families not the multiples that they that they end up incurring as a result of PFD cuts, uh, the top twenty percent who benefit from from the payments to the lower uh, from, from the payments on behalf of the lower twenty percent um, uh, uh, get off scot free as well. They don't have to pay taxes on it. Right now, there's been some criticism of this position that you and I have been talking about mm -hmm. of the you know the lower income earners being affected, the top twenty percent walking away pretty much unscathed. Is that we're fomenting class warfare? Um, that that's what we're pushing here. It's all about class warfare. And and again, I. I find that ironic, considering what's being waged across uh, the the spectrum against uh, all the you know all the income brackets except for the top twenty percent. So I find that to be ironic. But let's wrap up with uh, your thoughts on that and any kind of final thoughts on this uh, these comments as we go through. Well, to the extent there's class warfare, it's class warfare by the top twenty percent 
uh, against the uh, against the 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 other uh, the other eighty percent. I mean, they're the ones benefiting from the current system. They're the ones proposing to maintain the current system of using uh, PFD cuts to pay for government, uh, and, uh, and which lets them off uh, scot free. They're the ones pushing the legislature in the legislature and pushing the legislature uh, to continue to use uh, PFD cuts. So, if there is class warfare, if there is a uh, if there is some pushing going on on behalf of class, uh, it's the top 20% pushing to protect themselves uh, at the expense of the uh, of the other 80%. Yeah, and I would agree with that. I mean, again, uh, somebody in the chat room, uh, Chris, just said, you know, PFD cuts are uniform to everybody. I don't like it, but it seems silly to argue class warfare. Um, but the problem is, is that PFD cuts are uniform in the fact that they hit everybody, but they are seriously... Uh, problematic because they hit the lowest. I mean, if you're looking at something that is cutting some, you know, 35% of somebody's income versus 0.34% of somebody's income, there's a massive difference in how that is affected. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, what we, what, what our society lives on, what, what citizens live on is their income, right? And, and when you look at taxation or you look at any fiscal plan, you look at the effect on income uh, by, uh, uh, by uh, 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 income bracket, uh, that's how you assess the impact of any of any fiscal measure uh, on 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 citizens on on families. Um, I yeah, I, people try to say, oh, PFD cuts are even across the board. Well, they're not. Uh, when you look at it as a as a percent of income, which is how everybody when they sit down at their kitchen table looks at their lives. When you look at it as a percent of income, it has hugely disproportionate. Uh, on middle and lower income Alaska families and a hugely trivial effect uh, on the top 20 percent. And right. and to argue that to argue that the effects the same across the board is just to I mean, it's another top 20 percent myth, not to, another top 20 percent old wives tale uh, to uh, to try to justify uh, the impact that they're having on middle and lower income Alaska families. I say, Brad, um, I agree with you. I was shocked. I expected a lot of uh, venom and vitriol to be flying around in the chat room or in the uh, comment section on this. And I know that they're, I know that they are moderating the comments, but it's been pretty clear what the editorial board's position at the ADN is on this topic. And I thought maybe they'd be a little looser on the comment section. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, well, the, the other, th another thing that that struck me, Michael, is the comments weren't uniformly, you know, taxes are bad, you guys are nuts, uh, of that variety. There were supportive comments, uh, a lot of supportive comments. In fact, by the end, I checked it again this morning, by the end, it's about running about 50, 50 percent um, supportive comments. So I think people are beginning to get it. Um, I had one comment. Uh, I, I write the weekly, weekly column for the Alaska Landmine, and I've talked a lot about the PFD and the and the adverse impact of uh, the disproportionate impact of uh, of PF using PFD cuts to fund government, and I had one comment uh, in the last uh, well the next to last piece I wrote that said you know I finally understand this you you beat it into my head enough that I finally understand it, and asked some asked some fairly good questions about you know where do we go from here uh, as a result of it. So I think I think the the message um uh is not being uniformly rejected and i would guess to tell you the honest truth i would guess if if we went through and 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 looked at the comments and tried to assess what income brackets are coming from most of the negative comments would be coming from the top 20 percent income bracket and most of the positive comment comments would be coming from the other 80 percent yeah i would be interested to see a demographic and uh <clears throat> financial breakdown of the commenters uh, on that aspect for sure um, we're going to uh, jump into the uh, next segment here. We're going to talk about this. This included an exchange that uh, you had on a comment, um, uh, an article that was posted. Uh, somebody reposted your article, um, or reposted uh, uh, an opinion piece, rather, out of the ADN. And, um, and it was talking about a new ITEP report and some other things. And you had a very interesting exchange on this, so this is going to be part of it. But essentially, the question becomes, you know, is the PFD the only answer? Um, and the commenter on this piece, which, I mean, we'll get into here in a second, but this is a this is a common refrain. I want cuts, Brad. I think Brad want you want cuts, too, right? I mean, I'm not we're not we're not whistling in the dark here. But My, Michael, I just just to put this in context. I was the first one that wrote an op-ed in the ADN in 2012, 
pushing for cuts. That was a time at which a lot of people, including Bill Stoltz, who was a senator from the Valley, were still pushing more spending, more spending. But I was I was pushing cuts in 2012. I've consistently pushed cuts. Right. And frankly, and frankly, when I talk about a flat tax, when I talk about any tax, I think the ultimate result of that is going to be cuts. Because once you engage the top 20 percent, once you engage the donor class in having to pay for government, I think they're going to push back uh, on the cost of government and, and, and the result's going to be cuts. As long as you let them off the hook where they don't have to pay and they don't care about government spending levels, they're not going to push for cuts. So, yes, I've been for cuts since since way back before uh, cuts became cuts became a theme. I continue <laughs> to push them. I'm just I'm just looking for different ways. You were you were for cuts before it was cool. Is that what you're saying right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was before cuts before anybody else was writing in the ADN pushing them. In first is what Brad is saying. In first with the first comment on anything right there. Um, yeah, no, I uh, I I agree. I mean, this is something that we've been talking about for a long time. Unfortunately. Uh, even going back into 2018 with the governor's first budget, which had plenty of cuts, there was just, I mean, there was just no political will to get it done. It's its insane. It's absolutely insane. Um, and and I want to get into that here in, in just a hot minute. Doing the weekly top three, we're on a number two, which includes, uh, there was an opinion piece uh, in the ADN uh, that talks specifically uh, about uh, uh, how uh, an income tax would hurt less than a PFD cut. This is an I- ITEP report. Um, <clears throat> and you talk about ITEP and ICER and some of the other organizations talking about how PFD cuts, and we've been talking about this since 2014, are the most regressive, uh, affect the Alaska economy the worst, um, is, the, is the least best option that they have on the table, um, which leads me to the whole question of, Man, why can't we just cut this budget into something that is more manageable? <laughs> Which, of course, leads to the question of, well, to do that, you need 59 other people to agree with you. And that's been a big part of the problem here. So uh, the question is, Brad, are PFD cuts the only way that we can fund government? Can we live within our means or do we have to talk about taxes? Well, Michael... As I said uh, during the break, I've been at this since uh, since before, uh, since about 2010. Uh, and in 2012, I wrote uh, an op-ed piece in the in the ADN news minor. It appeared various places, uh, urging uh, spending cuts. At the time, I got a lot of pushback about, oh, we don't need to worry about that. You know, we've got oil money forever, and and uh, and you're just being a doomsayer to say that we need to cut spending. Um, but you know, I I, I continue to pursue it. Uh, and pushed uh, pushed spending cuts uh, uh, through uh, uh, through 2017. In 2017, uh, I had a meeting with, uh, with with several people who understood what was going down in the legislature on in the legislature, and the the result of that was, you know, the message came back was they're not going to cut spending, right? They're, they're not going to cut spending. So you just have to. This was after Walker's uh, uh, Walker's uh, uh, PFD cuts. They're not going to cut spending. You just have to accept that. And you have to accept that there's going to be PFD cuts. And as I probed it with those and others, I came to realize that the reason that we're not cutting spending uh, is because the top 20 percent, the donor class, don't uh, don't have any stake in the game. They don't have any skin in the game. Uh, PFD cuts have a uh, have a trivial impact uh, on uh, uh, the top 20 percent. Uh, and uh, and 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 they don't really care. And, and in fact, there's this devil's bargain uh, that became uh, that became clear between the Democrats who wanted increased government spending and the top 20 percent Republicans that, you know, the Democrats said, if you don't oppose spending, we won't go after you for taxes. And the top 20 percent Republicans said, we won't oppose spending if you don't come after us for taxes. So if, if we're going to break this cycle, if we're actually going to have spending reductions, we've got to get the top 20 percent in the game. It's not going to happen uh, with uh, with the push that has been uh, that we've been undertaking uh, to this point. And, and part of that, uh, part of that is getting the top 20% having skin in the game through them suffering the same sort of economic consequence that PFD cuts have on middle and lower income Alaska families, which is they have to contribute to the cost of government. As long as they don't, we're not going to get this solved. My, I believe the second that they have skin in the game, the second they have to contribute toward the cost of government, 
in an equitable fashion. I'm not saying we take all of it from the top 20 percent, but as, 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 as soon as they get skin in the game, I believe they're going to use their abilities and their influence as donors and as the controllers of lobbyists and various other things to push back on spending levels. And, um, and, and that's how we're going to achieve, achieve spending reduction. Well, but again, Brad, I think in one of the arguments, and this is the one that I try and wrap my head around the most because I agree with it, is we can look at places like California where they do tax the top 20%, and yet California has got the most out-of-control taxation and spending in the country. So by giving them access to more money and especially to that top 20%, you know, what's the just I mean, I understand what you're saying is that they're the ones that are influencing the legislature. Oh, now I'm paying. So now I'll influence them to cut. But I mean, we're we're looking at other examples around the country that that doesn't necessarily, you know, pencil out in the end. Well, California, uh, the problem with California uh, and the problem with Illinois, frankly, where I'm visiting my mother, is that they use a progressive, a highly progressive uh, income tax. I've never been an advocate of that. And the problem with with a progressive income tax is it pushes all of the costs to the top 20%. So you've got the remaining 80% that don't have skin in the game, and they continue to push for more government spending because they're not uh, incurring uh, part of the cost of government. The thing, the reason I push a flat tax uh, is because it affects all income brackets the same. Everybody, if we're going to take 2%, for example, which which is what it would take, 2% of adjusted gross, uh, total state adjusted gross income plus non-resident adjusted gross, gross income. If we're going to take 2% uh, of everybody's income, everybody's going to have the same stake in the game and everybody's going to push back on government spending uh, in the same way. The problem with California is they shove the burden. You know, the problem with Alaska is we shove the burden to middle and lower income Alaskas, Alaska families. The problem with California is they shove it to the top 20%. And the middle uh, and, and lower income families continue to push for government spending. We've got to have a way in which everybody has a stake in the game. Everybody has an incentive to, uh, to try to find that balance between the government they want and the government they're willing to pay for. And, and if you let one income bracket or one group of income brackets escape from that responsibility, um, then, then they're going to continue to push for government because it doesn't, it doesn't matter to them. California is a perfect example of going too far. Uh, the other way. And uh, Donna points out in the chat room, Illinois does have a flat income tax. Are they affected in the same way, in your opinion? Uh, Illinois does, has, has exemptions. So what you've got is a flat income tax on some people, uh, but exemptions on, on a large uh, bracket uh, of people. And so you still got a class that's not, that doesn't have uh, the same uh, skin of the game, and that class is is heavily represented in Chicago, uh, and Chicago uh, has a huge influence on uh, on how Illinois uh, politics operate. So, it's it it is not as extreme uh, as California in terms of pushing it uh, to the top income bracket, but it nevertheless is creating the reverse of the same thing we have in Al in California in Alaska, which is one income bracket isn't contributing at all. So the question is, are PFD cuts the only way to fund government? You've done the math, and obviously uh, the answer to that is no, there are other options. That's why you have talked about this flat income tax. And those of us who are still pulling for um, a more balanced budget with cuts, uh, are we whistling in the dark here? I mean, what? Uh, give, us, give us your take. Well, that was the – Michael, that was the – that was the message that I was given in, in, in these meetings in 2017, which is I was whistling in the dark, uh, that, uh, that, you know, I could talk myself blue in the face about where cuts could be made. I could, you know, come up with creative ways to do cuts in Medicaid. I could come up with creative ways to do cuts in K through 12, but they were never going to be adopted because uh, this, this devil's bargain existed between those who wanted to continue spending and, and the top 20% who didn't have to pay for it as long as we used uh, PFD cuts. So, there are other ways to do it. I mean, I've talked about flat tax. Others have talked about oil taxes, which uh, I, I'm a little skeptical of. I don't think we can raise enough money that way to cover to cover the deficits. Uh, I think there does have to be some personal contribution, but there other are other ways to do it. One of the arguments um, I heard uh, in this exchange you're talking about on Facebook was Alaska doesn't have enough revenue base uh, to support taxes. That is, there there isn't enough income in the state to support taxes. Well, that's ridiculous. I mean, by, Alaska has, according to IRS data, uh, Alaska has about $26, $27 billion 
uh, in adjusted gross income. By the time you add non-residents on top of that, and by the time you add back in the amount of PFD cuts, which would come back into the private sector, uh, if we use something else other than PFD cuts, you have about twenty-eight and a half, twenty-nine billion dollars of uh, of private sector uh, private sector income, uh, and with a with a deficit of a little or over five hundred million dollars, which was the deficit uh, closed by PFD cuts in this last budget. That's only two percent of adjusted gross income. So we've got we've got the revenue base in the private sector. There's a there's a, a some revenue base in the oil sector to to make additional contributions. We've got the revenue base to do it. The question is spreading. Are we going to spread that burden equitably across all income brackets, or as we do with PFD cuts, are we going to take that that two percent out of middle and lower income Alaska families only, uh, and let the top twenty percent off the hook? Which kind of leads us into number three uh, a little bit, because my question still remains, do we have enough ability to change the players to find people that have the uh, political will to cut so that we can avoid the taxation issue, uh, to find the political will to enshrine the uh, PFD in the Constitution so we don't have to keep revisiting this? And that leads us to number three, which again comes to the candidates' positions on everything from protecting the PFD to K-12 and everything else. Right. One of the things I want to do on the on the top three over the course of the of election cycle is sort of call is sort of identify the various issues that I think are going to be arising in the campaign, and talk about talk about the the, the candidates' uh, positions on those. One of them uh, was raised down in Ketchikan when Governor Dunleavy was was uh, was visiting down there. Uh, their board, their local school board, and their local government has adopted the position that we need to increase the BSA. We need to increase the amount of state government money going to, uh, going to uh, uh, local school districts. Uh, take the burden off the back of local school districts, put it on the back of the state. Here's the issue. By, by putting it on the back of the state using PFD cuts, you're essentially making middle and lower income Alaska families throughout the state pay more for school uh, schools uh, and letting the top 20% off the hook. Um, I think I think there's going to be a lot of people talking about increasing the BSA. There's a lot of candidates talking about increasing the BSA uh, this coming uh, this coming cycle. And and okay, let's talk about that. But let's talk about who pays for the increase in the BSA. Right. If you do it through PFD cuts, it's going to come off the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. It ought to be spread equitably. If we're going to do it, it ought to be spread equitably through all the income brackets. Give me a give me a, a even odds here. Look into your crystal ball because again, I de- I definitely am not giving up on the idea that we can cut into the state government. I am I agree that if we're going to have a conversation on taxes, that we should talk about the one that is fairest and most equitable and works the best. But I, for one, am not willing to give up that ground yet on the ability to change enough players out to cut the size and scope of budget. Now we're looking at this full length and breadth of players who are out there wanting to jump into this give me your odds your <clears throat> you know give me the over and under on whether or not you think that there'll be enough political will when the dust settles to actually get in there and 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 take a chainsaw to the state budget michael i don't think we gather the political looking over the last 10 years uh i don't think we gather enough political will uh to uh, to push back uh, on spending until every Alaska family is part of the conversation and every Alaska family has an incentive to push back on spending. The way we're doing it right now uh, and the way some want to maintain doing it uh, is through PFD cuts, uh, and we're, and that pushes the burden off on middle and lower income Alaska families. I, <laughs> there's, there, there, that it takes more money out of their pockets as a, as a share of their income uh, than it does uh, than, than it does the top twenty percent, and and as a result, the top twenty percent are not part of this discussion. They will say they are, uh, in order to deflect uh, uh, another conversation from from affecting them. In order to uh, deflect, uh, you know, somebody saying, "Well, you ought to participate in paying for it." They will say they're against spending, but when you look at the votes in the legislature, when you look at who's who's the ones holding the uh, holding spending up. It's Natasha, it's Gary uh, uh, Stevens, it's Bert Stedman. It's the top 20% in the legislature that are that are holding on. And, and you've got candidates out there. Uh, Doug Massey, the one run, running against uh, 
against uh, Mike Schauer, uh, essentially saying the same thing. He's, he's in favor of an affordable PFD. Well, that that just means that it's whatever's left over after you know after we paid for government spending. It, 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 we have to make all Alaska families part of the conversation, part of the pushback uh, to get this done. And the only way, the only way I have <coughs> thought through and, and, and thought how we can do that is to, is to extend the obligation to pay for government to all Alaska families through a flat tax. All Alaska families. No, no exceptions. The higher income don't get off with a lighter, lighter uh, uh, payment. Lower income don't get off with a lighter, lighter payment. Everybody contributes the same percent of income. Uh, and then everybody, you know, it contributes toward determining the balance between the government we want and the government we're willing to pay for. Well, I, you know, again, um, I, man, I, got, I just hope you're wrong. I mean, I hope that there is enough political will to get this. We've been fighting for this and people are, are upset about it. Um, uh, you know, again, I'm not against having a conversation about the best form of taxation if that's what it comes down to. I'm just not ready to give up on the idea that that we can get enough good people in there to make these choices. Um, and but your your over and under is nope. It's it's just not going to happen. There's not the My, not the will to get it done. Michael, we need to go through the candidates on on one of these segments. There are not enough candidates. <coughs> excuse me. Who are even saying they're willing to cut spending to get six to get sixteen to back up the governor if he would if he would ever try it again he won't uh, uh, this or a subsequent governor trying it again You're, you, we don't have enough candidates uh, to do it once you go through and, and piece together all of the uh, all of the positions out there so it's um, it, it, we we talk a good game about wanting to make cuts we've outlined gosh you and I spent the entire an entire decade. Uh, talking about you know how we could make cuts to Medicaid, how we could make cuts to the university, how we could make cuts right. uh, to K through twelve. An entire decade talking about that stuff. The, the all of all of the possibilities are there. You know how to do it. The political will isn't there, and the reason the political will isn't there is because we have one huge segment of the of the political population that that isn't pushing for it. So. It, we can continue talking about it, but I'm going to tell you, just talking about cuts only, just talking about you know spending cuts or bust, uh, is is just going to result in continued PFD cuts year after year after year of PFD cuts, uh, as that is the mechanism used to uh, to fund government spending. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> I uh, you know like I said, I'm 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 continuing to try and be optimistic. I'm trying to be practically optimistic. I don't know if it's going to work or not. Um, but we're going to keep uh, pushing that way. Um, as far as if there does have to be taxes, uh, I am in agreement with you that the flat tax makes the most sense. I don't see it as, be it, it as being the most popular option, again, because why would the top 20 percent uh, income earners in the state, the affluent and the ones who are most politically influential, be interested in throwing any of their skin into the game? But at least it should be talked about. But I'm not giving up hope on the idea that somehow we can get enough people in there who have the chutzpah to be able to cut. We've got to, I guess we've got to fight at it from both sides at this point. We, we do have to fight at it from both sides. And we have to, we have to keep the, the, the way in which we would make the cuts alive so that when we get the political will to do it, we don't have to go back and reinvent the wheel on how are we going to make, how are we make the cuts. But the, the primary thing uh, 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 that I've learned out of the last decade uh, is is generating the political will. And the primary thing about generating the political will is getting the top 20% engaged in the effort to push back on spending, not just giving lip service to it, but actively putting their resources, their efforts with the candidates they support uh, uh, towards uh, towards pushing back on it. And we just haven't seen that. All right, Brad, <clears throat> thank you so much for coming on board. I appreciate it. Enjoy your time with your mom, and uh, we look forward to uh, talking with you again uh, next week. Maybe we should uh, maybe we should, uh, we should, should do a whole top three, which is really just a top one of going through candidate by candidate and see who's got a record for what. That might be a good thing to talk about. Um, Michael, uh, uh, thanks for having me, and, I, and, and, and we'll see if we can piece that together. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. 
and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.